Merry Christmas, everyone. From the Heritage Foundation, I'm Tim Desher, and this is Heritage Explains. The Trump administration is making some big changes to the food stamp program. Today, the U.S. Department of Agriculture finalized a new rule expected to end food stamps for nearly 700,000 people. That was last week after Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue moved forward with a Trump administration goal to close loopholes used by states to allow recipients to remain on food stamps longer while not actively seeking a job or work training. I'm sure you can guess where this is heading. Here's a leading voice on the left, Julian Castro. It's stupid. It's cruel. It's exactly the wrong direction. We need to actually be providing more opportunity for people to get the food that they need. And bringing his usual tidings of good cheer, here's Senator Chuck Schumer from the Senate floor. The Trump administration is driving the vulnerable into hunger just as the Christmas season approaches. It is heartless. It is cruel, exposes a deep and shameful cruelness and hypocrisy in this administration. Wow. Harsh. But before the Grinch completely steals Christmas, let's at least hear from our Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue. What we want to do is increase employment. We need these people in the workforce. People who've been on the welfare, been on food stamps, we're trying to get them. And sometimes it is difficult when you've been out of a job for a long time. We're trying to help these people get back into uh, personal dignity of work and becoming part of the productive economy of the United States. Work is a good thing. It empowers people to strive for more and be better. Work is dignity. In the Bible, Proverbs 14.23 says, All hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Now, Washington is a town full of great intentions. Nobody on the left or right wants another person to stay impoverished. But perhaps the good intentions of programs like food stamps are leading more people to poverty rather than lifting them up. If this is the case, logic says the most compassionate thing to do is to change the system. On this week's episode, we take a special look at the Trump administration's attempt to reform the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, what it means for those impacted, and what that means for our nation and our economy. Robert Rector is a senior research fellow here at the Heritage Foundation, and this week, he explains... Robert Rector, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And so just for a little bit of context, because I know a lot of our listeners may not have um, a lot of knowledge on this issue. Currently, I've seen the number about 37 million Americans receive SNAP benefits or or food stamps. Um, For my calculations, that's almost one in 10 Americans. So what do food stamps buy? Uh, Food stamps are worth about – if you're not working, they're worth about $200 a month per person. So a family of four would be getting like $800 a month. They're intended to enable a family to purchase a sort of minimal secure food package without putting any of their own money into it. And uh, they provide a a valuable safety net. The, The problem is that you want that safety net to work more like a trampoline than a bog. And you you want to have a system that's going to give people aid when they need it, but not generate unnecessary dependence, which actually harms them. So, what are the current requirements in order to get them? Not much. You just <laughs> you you basically just have to tell the food stamp office that you don't have much income in the household. Often, that's not true. They they're very recipients are very good about hiding income, or having people in the household that are hidden, that do have earnings, but. If you don't have income, you get you get this. If you do have some income, it's going to d- bring down the value of the benefits a little bit, but not that much. 
And um, basically, there are virtually no work requirements in them. So that and you wouldn't want to have work requirements on elderly people or disabled people. There are no work requirements on parents with children in there. But there is a tiny work requirement uh, put on able-bodied adults between the age of 19 and roughly 50 who don't have any kids. And uh, that work requirement was created way back as part of welfare reform under Bill Clinton in the 1990s. And it said that a certain portion of these able-bodied people who don't have any dependent children and aren't working should be required to, after a bit, work or at least prepare to get back in the workforce as a condition for getting aid. Wasn't controversial when it was enacted, but loopholes were created in the regulations that administer this law so that states who want to basically don't have to enforce this law at all. The Trump administration is saying, hey, after 20 years... So what, so let me just stop you there. So back when the economy tanked in 2009, mm -hmm. the states were given probably great latitude from the Obama administration right. to well, choose whether or not the to... The latitude is, is built into the law when the unemployment rate rises, the, the amount of people basically... People get exempted. One in ten of these able-bodied people can be exempted no matter what. Okay. And But now the economy is, is kind of going very well. And so the Trump administration has is saying done, yeah. it's actually time after 20 years to actually enforce this thing. Wow. It, and it's very modest. Like there are about 3 million out of, out of the close to 40 million people getting food stamps. There are about 3 million of these able-bodied adults without kids who are getting food stamps. Nearly all of them are completely unemployed and, and don't work at all. And the Trump administration is saying, well, out of the three million, we'd like one million of you to, to get a job. And if you can't get a job, we're not going to just kick you off. We're going to ask you to come in and do certain types of activities that will help you get a job. Supervised job search, a thing called job prep, where you work with their resume, teach them how to interview better. Uh, do some formal training if you want to do that, or do community service work. But the basic idea is that you you want to give assistance absolutely to people who need it. You never, ever want to cut them off. And, and I've worked in this field for 40 years as a conservative. I've never proposed cutting any person off just because they don't have a job. Mm -hmm. But you want to say, look, we're here to help you, but we expect you to take some steps to help yourself back because you know what? That's fair to the taxpayer and it's best for you, too, as a recipient. So many on the left, I heard, like uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, they're, they're attacking this as a, quote, a cruel act, um, especially, you know, using Christmas. It's so close to Christmas. And in addition, uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, she tweeted, I'm going to read you her tweet here. She said, quote, my family relied on food stamps when my dad died at 48. I was a student. If this happened then... We might have just starved. Now, many people will, end quote. I mean, that's pretty harsh. So what's your response? I wonder, does she write these things herself? I mean, because she, <laughs> she, she really seems to go out of her way not to understand what the policy does. And the policy is very clear that families with children are not affected by this at all. And again, uh no one really should be cut off and no one would be cut off. Most of the states that are affected by this are blue states because they're the ones with all the loopholes, you know. So you're saying, OK, blue states, now you, you're going to have to take one in three of these people and actually try to move them toward work. And, and the response is, oh, well, they're just going to throw them in the streets. I'm sorry, California is going to throw these people in the streets. Because if you're saying that, you're saying a whole lot about the, the, the progressive government in California. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that's just amazing about this is even if you were to say that, like, oh, they're just being thrown. Well, any one of these blue states could actually just give, their, give uh, some sort of food aid with their own state money. But they sure as heck don't want to do that. It's most amazing. But in, in the welfare state, we spend over $1.1 trillion a year providing cash, food, housing, and medical care for the poor. And that's my, que that's my question. So if you, even if they were to lose these benefits, they're going to have access to other benefits in the quote-unquote social safety net. Is that correct? S some, somewhat, yeah. Okay. They certainly, in most cases, would have access to free medical care. Um, 
But they then they don't have kids. They don't get that much. Okay. But the, the broader point I'm making here is that out of this 1.1 trillion. Uh, over uh, about 80 percent of that is funded by the federal government and states actually only pay into medicaid so if you go to like cash food and housing this is close to a 90 percent federally funded system how did that come about now just taking a step aside from our conversation with robert michelle and i love doing this podcast for you we love communicating great policy issues uh, at a 101 level and making it so you can then go and share with your friends and your family. Now, to do this, we need your support. So we're asking that you would consider giving Heritage Explains a special year-end gift, and you can do this by visiting heritage.org, scrolling all the way down to the bottom, and hit the Donate button there, and you can specify Heritage Explains podcast uh, in, in the giving line. Again, head over to heritage.org. We really thank you for even considering giving us a year-end gift, and uh, we look forward to continue doing this in 2020. All right, back to our conversation with Robert. Let's talk about the economics of this. I read the number that we have 7.1 million open jobs in America. Um, In order to keep growing, we need to either get more efficient or we need to find people to fill these jobs. Do you see this as a way of filling these jobs? Oh, a little bit, yes, yeah, but and, and I'm much more number? concerned. I, I, the bulk of the matter is when you put a work requirement on this, like this, onto a work capable individuals, most of them drop off the rolls, hmm. and and they do that one because a lot of them are working off the books. It's a very common thing. It's not the worst crime, <laughs> you know. It's not the crime of the century, but they have jobs that are hidden from the tax collector, hidden from the the city government regulator, and they're hidden from the welfare office too. Right. And so, when you put a work requirement on them for even one day a week, that's going to interfere with this this hidden job, and so they disappear. And that's a very constant thing in welfare, not only in the United States. States, but in the United Kingdom, every place. It's not, it's, but it, so it flushes fraud out. Those are people who don't have any alternative way of support. They, they are able to come in and the, and the bureaucracy, to the extent that welfare bureaucracies do anything, okay, can now focus on them and on meeting their needs. And that's what these state governments should, should be addressing here because it is really cruel and harmful to let work capable people in the in the prime of their life sit on food stamps for month after month after month with no employment not only does that ensure that they are poor during that period but it also undermines their overall lifetime in, in earnings because every month or every 6 months you spend out of the labor force you your capacity to earn in the future goes down. This is a very cruel thing to allow this prolonged, unnecessary dependence. You call this in your piece, and I'm going to link to this piece. You all have to go on and read it on the Daily Signal. Uh, so just click on the show notes and, uh, and, and you'll get right to it. But you call this a, quote, nudge in the right direction. Um, so with that, uh, what more needs to be done and... Can it be done through the White House like this was done, or does it have to go through Congress? Either one. Okay. Um, What what has to happen here is that conservatives have to have the courage of their conviction because this policy is almost universally supported in the United States. Over 9 out of 10 Americans say the following, quote, If an able-bodied adult gets cash, food, housing, or medical care from the government, they should be required to work or prepare for work as a condition of receiving aid. Nine out of ten people who identify as Democrats (laughs) agree with that statement. This is the fundamental Reagan idea behind welfare. And the only people that disagree with this are AOC and and the progressives, but they dominate the, the hysteria in the media and they dominate all the false news that's out there. But what the American people are telling us is a basically conservative idea that they believe that people who need aid absolutely should get it, but that the best form of aid is that if you give aid to people who are capable of supporting themselves, 
you want to require some positive behavior back in exchange. That's not only fair to the taxpayer, but it, more importantly, it's overwhelmingly in the interest of the recipient who does not benefit simply by giving one hand out after another, month after month after month, while they socially marginalize themselves. You're sort of guaranteeing that they will not succeed in society. So a compassionate welfare system gives and is generous toward those who need assistance but it also challenges them to to exercise the better angels in their nature and step up uh, to to try to better support themselves. So much of your research has it's helped guide me throughout my young career so far, and and many of my millennial counterparts through difficult days in liberal academia. Um, I recall using some of your work on welfare reform from the 90s, like you were just talking about, to rebut professors in college. Um, and they the look of shock on their face. After, I mean, it was just in, as if they'd never heard anything like that before. Um, I think your ideas are, are, are groundbreaking, and they're also common sense. Um, I'm wondering, do you think that your message of work being a virtuous thing, do you think that's still will resonate with millennials and Gen Z coming up? I, I think it will because I, I think that anybody who actually cares about poor people can, can kind of see that a system where you just sort of put people on the shelf yeah, and and say you really don't have any capacities of your own, you have no life to live, but here, here's some free stuff, uh, that that really has never helped the poor um, and anyone who looks at this in common sense, you can understand that if you actually want to boost these incomes, it's far better to have a system where the benefits complement and reinforce positive behaviors like work and marriage. The two come together in a sort of synergistic package, and incomes are going to go up much better than if you have a system where the benefits are actually displacing work or displacing marriage, which is the way the current welfare state works. So that – in terms of fairness to the taxpayer who is generous but doesn't want to be taken for a ride and in terms of fairness to the recipient who really in the long term doesn't benefit from non-work, non-marriage and welfare dependence, uh, we need to, to, um, to, to change this system. And this philosophy that I'm articulating actually started with Ronald Reagan – Bill Clinton took it and it put him in the White House. And I think it's actually kind of a shame that the Republican Party has walked away from it and and hasn't been as as strong with it in terms of supporting these basic ideas because the American public believes it. And But it's important that these reforms be focused on imp- improving the lives of the poor rather than trying to cut 15 cents out of the welfare state, which is, is a Republican habit. And it's a it's an unfortunate one. When we set out to do welfare reform 20 years ago, we really didn't set out to save money. We set out to change the philosophy and moral tenor of the welfare system by saying just at that point we had one in six American children on a program called AFDC with single moms who didn't work really. And and everyone at that time recognized, including the, the, the liberal left, that that system was a disaster – and that you had to change that to move toward a direction of pro-work, pro-marriage. We just need to do a lot more than that. We, we've got over 90 programs, most of which are completely unreformed. Uh, we need to change them all to be fair to the taxpayer and to be beneficial to the poor. Robert, what an honor. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this week on Heritage Explains. Thank you. That's it. Another episode of Heritage Explains is in the can. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to all of you. And with that, go ahead and share with us what your favorite Christmas or holiday tradition is. Now, I'll share mine. It's belly laughing to the movie Christmas Vacation with all of my family sitting around a fire. Happens every year and it it only gets better. So to do that, why don't you go ahead and leave us a comment wherever you listen, or you can email us at managingeditor at heritage.org. Also, give us a Christmas present this year by leaving us a five-star rating, or more importantly, share our podcast with your friends and family. Michelle's up next week with a brand new episode to close us out for the year. 
Heritage Explains is produced by Michelle Cordero and Tim Desher, with editing by Thalia Rampersad.